few people coming in for your webinar, Simon. <laughs> I'm going to upgrade you all to um, to panel. So don't uh, don't fret. You're not going to have to lead the uh, demonstration. Uh, but I'm going to be just it's just nice to have you guys in the room. So I'm going to put you all in the panel. This will take a little moment. Antoine, there you are. The boss is in the room, Simon. <laughs> Here we go. Um, promote you all. I have no, no Jerome had to help me here. Jerome is coming in though, I think. We'll see Jerome in a minute. Uh, oh, there's Jerome. I'm about to pull him in. Here we go. Bonjour, Jerome. Uh, sorry about this, guys. It just takes a minute or two to do this. Um, hopefully you all have your wines handy in a glass beside you. Um, there we go. Sorry about this. But if we have it all on Zoom, we don't have all the um, we don't have all the capabilities of a webinar. So, oh, Paul, hello, Paul, Simon, another Simon. That could be get confusing there, Simon. We might have to ask tricky questions to the other Simon. Uh, here we go. Okay, I think we have everyone in. The panel now. Yeah, we can see everyone. Um, okay, well, now we've got everyone in the panel. I might stop screen sharing for a minute there. That's sort of my uh, help. And so I can see you all. Um, good evening. Thank you very much for coming to our slightly late St. Patrick's Day uh, tasting with Simon Tyrrell. We're really lucky to, um, to have an Irish winemaker who can actually make really good wine. Uh, I, it took me a little while to realize this until I actually remember the evening when Simon put a bottle of his Sansa on the kitchen island at my parents' house. And um, he's like, here, try this. And uh, I was a bit dismissive being a newly sort of crowned master of wine, thought I was great. And uh, Simon, um, and we, Simon opened it and we tried it and it was absolutely delicious. Um, and it's just so exciting to have a winemaker like this who started off as a wine importer and uh, and is now making some of the best Rhone wines that I've tasted um, in the in the price bracket that they sit Simon not to you know. Uh, we have a slideshow this evening uh, which will guide us. Uh, I, Simon has been all over um, the press with his uh, with his wines this week, being the week that's in it. So we're very lucky to have him. Um, but he also he's done little patches here, there, and everywhere. He was with Eli on Instagram Live on Tuesday night, um, and he spoke at length about his life in wine, how he um, came to be a winemaker, and a lot of the sort of uh, struggles that he might have come across. So that's like part one, and that's on the Instagram for Eli. So we're going into part two, and I'm gonna try and sort of pull apart some other things that are more interesting from Simon's winemaking and time in the vineyards. So I'm actually going to introduce you to Simon uh, and uh, let him introduce himself and talk about how he came from being an importer to being a wine merchant. To being a wine, sorry, wine maker even. It's been a long day. <laughs> Over to you, Simon. Thanks very much, Harry, for that very nice introduction. Um, yes, I suppose the, uh, the, it was a long path to coming around to this. And I guess if I'm honest with myself, it's probably something in hindsight I wish I'd done a lot earlier. Um, just because I think it's a it's a very exciting place to be uh, actually producing something. I think it's um, you know it's a rare opportunity to get to produce and and it, the thing about wine making is it's a very it's a multidisciplinary uh, job. You know you have to understand viticulture, enology, wine making, um, and then there's the marketing side and there's the creative side of labeling and then and then there's the selling and then there's the very practical stuff of you know tractor driving and pruning and things like that. So it's 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 in many ways I wish I'd started earlier. But um yeah I suppose briefly just to explain how I got to it. Um, I don't come from a winemaking family, uh, a wine drinking family. Um, and my first introduction really to wine was when I moved to Paris when I was 22. 
after a degree in economics and I really had no idea what I was going to do with my life and uh, ended up in Paris in 1989 it, the, um, in time for the bicentenary celebrations there, which was like a, just an incredible place to be then. Um, and I got a job working in a wine bar um, for guys who uh, really specialized in, in wines from the Rhone Valley. And so that was where my, my love of, of the Rhone started. Um, anyway, fast forward a number of years, I moved from that side of the business to um, being on the road as a salesperson. I worked for a, a very large French um, producer and uh, merchant called La Société des Vins de France, which then became Castel, um, selling famous brands such as, and this will take people back a bit if, if they're of a certain age, they'll remember them, but La Villageoise, which was um, wine in a plastic bottle. Um, and we're going back there now, Simon. I mean, you yeah, know, you're yeah. not seeing this is the latest trend. We're all meant to be buying in plastic bottles, These recycled were, plastic. Th that that <laughs> that epoch wasn't quite as sophisticated as today's uh, today's versions. Um, yeah. Also, classic brands such as Vieux Pap and um, and things like that. Anyway, um, it was a very good experience for me, and it taught me also how to speak French. Um, and then. Um, 2000, I set up a, a wine importing business with a couple of colleagues that then morphed in 2003 into my own business with Emma, my wife. Um, at that time, we weren't 100% specialized in, in wines from the Rhone, but we eventually became just really Rhone specialists in, in, for the Irish market. What, what pulled you to the Rhone, Simon? Uh, what, was, you know, what was the sort of catching factor there? I think um, I think when I went down there for the first time, uh, well, so, sorry, rewind a little bit. When I was in um, Willie's Wine Bar and Ju Juveniles, which is one of their other uh, wine bars, tasting these wines, you know, Rhone wines are not uh, are very accessible to to people, particularly wines from the Southern Rhone. You know, if you taste a Côte de Rhone, that it's it's generally quite generous, quite easy to get into. You know, they're not Côte de Rhone's are, are for the most part not hugely sophisticated don't require a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of aging things like that mm. and so I was tasting these wines that you know when you and you know this Harriet when you're when you're a young wine drinker you know you appreciate the fruit and um, some of the sort of forward qualities of those styles of wines and I I just was really taken by them and well even last night, uh, I was, we were grilling some sausages down by the river, uh, you know, our little sort of lockdown barbecue en famille. And uh, what did I reach for but a bottle of Cote de Rhone because mm. it's just so easy to drink and they yeah. just go with everything. So, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, interestingly, actually, I think down the line, we, we lost sight of that a little bit in, in the Rhone. But anyway, um, uh, so I was, I was really taken by this, 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 taste profile and then when I visited the region for the first time uh, which I think was in a, must have been about 1990 went down with a girlfriend I had at the time and she had some friends who lived just outside Carpentra which is just under the Mont Ventoux and it was the time of um, the films like Jean de Floret and Manon des Sources and things like that and I had so I had this image of Provence in my, in my mind and it was exactly that these little hilltop towns um, and none of the, you know, Paris, I absolutely adore Paris, but Paris is quite a, um, it's quite a, you know, it's a very sophisticated city and it's got quite rigorous social structures and things like that. And, and the Rhone has none of that. Uh, the Rhone is a very um, egalitarian kind of place. And I think that really, really appealed to me. It didn't have any of the sort of the, the stiffness, not, not the stiffness, but the, the traditions of Bordeaux. And it didn't have all the, the, the the difficulties of Burgundy in the sense that you know the, the lack of accessibility mm. uh, you get in Burgundy. So you know. Is it a little bit like a sort of uh, a warmer litre? <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah, I guess yeah. There's a, there's a, you know there is the the it's just a very open place um, and you know when you go there you generally for the most part meet the winemaker. The winemaker will be come in from the vineyards. They'll do the tasting with you. Um, they may sell you a few bottles of wine or they'll talk to you about the possibility of exporting their wine. Whereas, you know, you go to Bordeaux, you know, how many, how many winemakers do you actually get to meet in the top 
top well, chateau. Well, no, exactly. You get shut. You get, you actually have to taste in the stables because you can't even go into the chateau. Exactly. Uh, so um, you probably yeah. get stirred in a half bottle. Um, yeah, but but it but when you um, changed, when you became a winemaker, Simon, did you um, was it it was it was through the sort of economy plunging down a little bit that you diversified and went to winemaking college, wasn't it? Yeah. So I think what the catalyst for me um, changing direction, age forty four, was that the the economy had really tanked. Or a here. midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Fancy talks you, Harriet. Um, <laughs> from my point of view, um, I yeah, the, the economy obviously two thousand and eight, you know, was just in a really bad place, and you know, you could see coming down the line things had become you know they were getting more and more difficult. And we're going to only get worse. Um, and I had, was really taken by this idea of, of of making wine, and so I said to my wife, "Look, I'm just going to go off for." Uh, you know, part time for a couple of years, study winemaking, get to know how 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 the parole process is done, and that will make me a more effective salesperson when I when I eventually come back. And so she said, "Yeah, that's absolutely grand." And anyway, within a month of arriving at Plumpton College, where I did my my my, my qualification, I came home one night and said, "Right, you know, that's it. We're packing every, everybody up and moving to make wine in, in the south of France." <laughs> And I, I, I love the way you said it was a part-time course. You had to fly to London twice a week, didn't you? Yeah. Or to Plumpton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Brighton. It's, actually, it's amazing. I, I remembered the other day that I used to book my tickets way in advance. And it was at the time that Ryanair was still doing very cheap flights. And I used to get, um, I remember, I think it was my final year, I was getting return flights to Gatwick for 22 euros. Um, it, was right. it was just extraordinary. That I, and that really helped me. And I thank Ryanair for, for them doing R that because rumor has it they're cheaper at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and you know what? I arrived. I have to say, I arrived in Plumpton College rather arrogantly. I think, thinking I've been in the wine business since you know I was twenty-two. I really know what I'm talking about. And I think within about a week, I realised that actually I knew jack shit in, in, on the scientific side of, of mm. winemaking. Um, and that I had an enormous amount to, to learn. And I think it was, and I'm sure you've gone through this as well, doing your master's, is that you, you know, you, you realise the subject can go on and on and on and on and on. It's just a massive, massive learning um, field, of, field of knowledge. That, that's what's so great, though, isn't it? Because, like, you, you've, you've touched on the, the sort of structure of winemaking and production in the, in the vineyard and the winery, and I've sort of touched on a layer of it, a little bit of everything. And now for the rest of our lives, we can go and immerse ourselves a little bit deeper in what interests us. And that's what I love about it. And I think that's what you guys all love about wine is that you can listen to us talk about this and then you might go away after this and go, right, I want to learn a little bit more about that sort of uh, the, the soil he was talking about, the vineyard or how the minerality is affecting the wine. And, and, and that is the beauty of wine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, and, and I think that, you know, I, I, I think I said the other night, you know, I was I was an F grade student at chemistry at school. I mean, I was really bad. I just didn't get it at all. Um, and then and, and then someone we had a, we had an Australian um, enologist. He, he's now involved with a place called Rathfinney Estate in, 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 in Sussex. And um, he was just brilliant. He's a chemical engineer by training, but was also an enologist and just was really into wine and so he was able to present chemistry in a way that was just I found fascinating um mm. and so I this, this field that I had absolutely been so scared of suddenly became became you know a real field of interest for me um so yeah and you don't regret it anyway it's uh, it was definitely a huge turning point in your life that you look back yeah. on with no as I say the only thing I regret is I didn't do it earlier um mm. you know the the experience uh, for anybody who wants to or thinking about becoming uh, a winemaker, I couldn't recommend Plumpton, you know, highly enough. And the whole experience is just just amazing. Um, and then, it, you know, that's not to say that, that what goes afterwards is necessarily easy. And they, in fact, in fairness to Plumpton, they make it very clear to you all the way along that you should never think that just by going there that you can then walk out the door and it's all going to be rosy. You know, there are there are a number of steps to take before you can actually become successful as a as a winemaker. And, and even good winemakers don't necessarily make a success of it because there's the whole, as I said, it's a multidisciplinary 
thing. You've got to be good at selling the wine as well. Would you compare it to learning how to be a chef? Yes, I think I think in 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 many ways it, it, there, it, that probably also depends a little bit on which region you end up choosing because um, you know for example if you go to the Rhone there are a lot of ingredients if you can make that comparison whereas perhaps if you made wine in well sorry if you go to the southern Rhone there are lots of ingredients if you go to the northern Rhone you know there's only there's only Syrah for the for the red so it's a little bit um, it's how many versions can you cook you know, the same thing on, whereas we, we are faced with a number of different raw materials. So yes, I think in that way, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's a good analogy to make. Yeah, I love, I love that idea because I love my cooking and I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I, I'm very happy to leave the winemaking to the winemakers because, you know, you can't do everything and you definitely don't want to come up and decide you're going to do it and then be bad at it. So I live in fear of that and hats off to winemakers everywhere because I know it's far more difficult than it looks. Well, but think- the idea of blending, oh, the idea of blending is just wonderful. Sorry, Simon. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think, but I think that's just a really interesting point because actually, you know, you, you have a lot of people who, a lot of winemakers or domain owners who are very skilled at one part of it. Um, so they could be really good grape growers, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a good, good winemaker or they could be really good winemakers, but not, not very good grape growers. Mm. The, and I think what makes the really rare and very interesting people that we come across in, 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 on that side of the business is the person who's capable of doing everything. And on top of that, they you know, design really nice labels and, they, and they, they, they sell their wines really well. They have a personality to, to do that. And it's, it's a rare enough thing. I mean, I can think of a number of growers that we buy grapes from who are, who are for our negotiation business, who are really great i mean you know biodynamic organic biodynamic growers masters of their art um but it doesn't necessarily mean they make good wine mm, exactly I well, i'm gonna hello. share this hello. hello who's who's asking a question john hi john, john. how are you <laughs> i'm good i'm good i'm getting concerned though my white sample is almost evaporated i'm wondering <laughs> Could we move on? Let's, let's go on to that. Let's open that up. Yeah, yeah. quite right, John. <laughs> Mine's sitting here. I, I only haven't drunk it because I've been talking too much, John. You're quite right. You keep us on the straight and narrow. Yeah. <laughs> so our first sample, and, and while, I'm, while, we're, while, I, while uh, Simon is introducing this, I'm going to share the screen because we've got some lovely shots of the bottles because Obviously, with samples, you don't get the bottles as such. So um, I'm going to ask Simon to introduce this wine. And I'm going to hopefully not put him off his chat by just showing a couple of shots. We had some lovely photos done in the shop the other day. And actually, Simon hasn't even seen these yet. So I think he might be stealing them for his uh, promotional material as well. So over to you, Simon, with this delicious Lumiere. Okay, so um, we are about to taste uh, Côte d'Aron La Lumiere. Uh, 2019, which is from our Atelier des Sources business. Um, so just briefly, Atelier des Sources, we buy the grapes. They don't come from our own vineyards. So we have what's called a negociant business, a broking business, uh, where we're able to buy from people we know um, or other contacts, uh, you know, hopefully high, high quality grapes. So um, La Lumiere is a blend of 90% Roussan and 10% uh, Bobulenk. And the Roussan part comes from a friend's vineyard just, just around the corner from um, our domain. Um, it's a very small little one, one third of a hectare plot uh, planted on a limestone loam soil. Um, and the Bobulenk part comes from actually our own vineyards. Um, and it's a very, very old parcel. It's of 1947, it was planted in. And it's a very high altitude uh, plot. With, well, very high. It's a high altitude plot at 220 meters called Pigeot. Um, and I, I think, so i quickly explain how we make the wine and then I can tell you perhaps a bit I more. Ha- Simon, just quickly, if I, I, is my screen sharing, is it just the bottles at the moment? I've just got the bottles on a barrel. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. Brilliant. I just had to check that. And I'm going to go to the, the so this is from the Pijou uh, vineyard, yeah? So the Bourboulenc part is from, from Pijou. Okay, I'm going to find that and uh, and go into 
Wait, hold on. No, that's see, this Vecchia. is it. That one. That, that's, is it that one? No, that, that was Vecchia that you had. That's Peugeot. Okay, hold on. The one I was on just now. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Um, that one there. That's so this yeah. is this is from here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in fact, the uh, if you're looking at the screen, the the um, this is a newer part of the vineyard. These were planted in 1981, but these are Grenache vines. But over to the left of the of the photo, are in fact, where the where the older Bourboulenc and some Carignan uh, um, are as well. So excuse so, me. Um, so the Bourboulenc is slightly higher up and more sheltered, is it? So that it uh, doesn't get as much sunshine as the Grenache in the center. Um, I, no, actually, the, the 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 plot is is like a square um, on a on a plateau. So it's actually the sort of even distribution of sunlight. What we do get in this parcel, though, so in fact, the the Roussan part, you see the van down the bottom, and then yeah. a, then a hill, and then a far hill in the distance. Well, between that hill and the hill in the distance is a valley called La, la Vallée de la Cèze, and down in that valley is where the Roussan is. So. Okay here we're higher up and what we get here it's a very windy uh parcel this is at 220 meters altitude and we get we're right in the path of the mistral and uh, which put comes the wind that comes down from the north so which helps keep this very clean disease lowers the disease pressure and also um keeps the keeps the vineyard fresher than, than the vineyards down down in the valley um so we so we we hand hand harvest the grapes. Um, the the decision to ha to harvest is really done just by constant um, constantly going through the vineyards prior to prior to picking and tasting the grapes. And by tasting them, you get a very good idea of the fruit character, the the acidity, and and in reds, of course, the the the, the tannin levels as well. And by by tasting those, we 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 decide when the time is right for picking. Simon, on this white, the texture on it is lovely. So mm. do you leave the whites on the skins for a little while um, to get that little bit of texture? And that oh, I think that, that's an interesting question, actually. No, we, in fact, so we, we actually, when we harvest, we press, we put, we put the grapes straight into the press and mm. we press directly. We have a closed, closed press, so it's not oxidative. Um, and so there's no there's no skin contact, and the reason that we don't have to look for that is because Roussan is a great variety that where we are can get ripe quite quickly. In fact, it can go from underripe to overripe fairly fast. So, um, and because it's quite a you know the the sugar levels are quite high in the grape, we during fermentation you produce a certain amount of glycerol, and glycerol gives us that that really nice fatter mouthfeel that you're uh, mm. you're talking about. Um, but the reason that we we add the bourboulenc is because bourboulenc down us gets ripe at kind of 12, 12.3, 12.5 percent, so quite low. But yeah. more interestingly, it has very high acidity, low pH. And, and by that, I'm talking in 2000, this year, 2019, for this wine, the pH on the bourboulenc was three, which is the same kind of pH you would have in, say, if you're making wine in the UK, or mm. you know, you would have had in the past in, in Champagne. And so that by blending the two together, it's only 10% the Bourbon, but that 10% helps bring freshness to that 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 nice opulent um, mouthfeel. I love the. Um, I, I'll never forget. It was Francis Robinson who, and a lot of you probably heard me say this, um, who said that you get wild gorse flowers well obviously you don't cultivate gorse but you get gorse flowers spring gorse flowers on the nose of Roussin and I really get that on this because the gorse is just coming out at the moment on the hill beside us mm. and uh, and and you do get that lovely slightly floral sort of you know just wilderness on the nose which is just lovely yeah um yeah. Uh, I mean and 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 with with this wine obviously you know it's not a cheap everyday Cote de Rome. It's a it's a wine that's made for food. It's a wine that's made for uh, for aging. I'm presuming I'll I'll, get, I'll ask you that in a minute. But but yep. you do you use older oak on this to give it a little bit more stability. So that that's that yeah it's interesting that because the um, this is actually so we ferment in barrel and we age it in the same barrel. It never never leaves the barrel until bottling time. This is a hundred percent new oak. Um, really? Yeah. Simon, you shock me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I thought you weren't a New Oak man. <laughs> well, I think this is a very interesting question because uh, the role of oak, we don't really talk about it enough in the Southern Rhone. You talk about it a lot in Burgundy and Bordeaux and, and the Northern Rhone, but we don't really talk about it in the South because traditionally we haven't used much New Oak. Um, and so the choice of um, the choice of Cooper is extremely important. And what we the, where we source this barrel is actually it's a six hundred liter barrel is from a cooperage called uh, Atelier Centre France. And what they do here is they don't toast the barrel; they steam it. And so you don't get any of that kind of classic, uh, some of the classic volatile aromas that you would associate with new oak, traditionally with yeah. new oak, that kind of toasty brioche uh, vanilla thing. You get, so we get what the oak does here is it actually adds a, an extra support to the wine a structure. It brings yeah. tension and basically it's, if you imagine it's sort of a circle as it starts, the, what the oak does is it, brings it more into like a, a square. It, it adds a bit of sides to it rather than giving it any kind of extra flavor. There's a little bit of flavor. And how did you learn about this? Because, you know, you're new to winemaking uh, and you're new to the area, uh, you know, and obviously like the French like to keep all their secrets close to their chest. So, so you know, how did you pick up on this? Because it's just, I think it's brilliant. I just love it. I love well, the fact that you're, you're doing the, 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 I mean, I've always been fascinated in the idea of, of of, of the role of oak in wine and I think that was that's an influence from having been an importer not starting off as a winemaker having gone to Burgundy Northern Rhone you know etc I'd seen how they how they used oak and then I'd seen what they were doing in the Southern Rhone so I had this real fascination with with oak and how the different barrel makers can affect uh, how their barrels can affect the wines this Actually, the, the knowledge about Atelier Centre France, we're very lucky because there's, there's a waiting list to get the barrels. Um, mm -hmm. But one of my partners in, um, in Atelier des Sources is a guy called Thomas Schmittel. And he's the co-owner of a place in Crows Hermitage called Domaine des Lies. Uh, and he co-owns it with a guy called Maxime Grayo, Domaine Grayo. And Domaine Grayo, for people in the know is one of the great reference estates of, of France. You know, they are they are the reference in Crozet Hermitage. Um, and so um, Thomas working with Maxime, of course they have the they have access to you know all the doors open for them. And so we were able to just slide in on 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 the coattails of Domaine Grayo, Domaine Delis, and get get one demi mouille in 2019 and two more in 2020 but as they are 1800 euros a pop Shit. you have yeah. to go you have to go <laughs> slowly and hence the price also as well yeah you're uh, yeah adds a bit to your cost of you're making your wine yeah and how many bottles of la lumiere are you producing simon so in uh, in 2019 only 800 but in 2020 we've we've tripled that Okay, that's so. lucky because um it is delicious and yeah. um if you haven't seen the bottle it looks very straightforward from the front and then the back is beautiful so simon tell us about the label because this is new this year isn't it yeah Last so the, the <laughs> as i was telling somebody earlier today uh, i always had this thing about sitting at the breakfast table reading the reading anything and even down to the cereal box and you know i loved i think it was innocent drinks when they first came out and you could you could look at the carton and as you kept turning it you keep finding things to to discover and so that was the philosophy behind the labels with atelier is that you'd actually as you turned the label you would discover uh things as you went along and so i um enlisted the help of a, of a very talented french artist uh, who actually lives in in brighton in the uk called um charlotte um Paskiewicz. and she she did all the paintings um and, and she did all the label design as well so well, they're really cool. They're really cool because, you know, whatever people say nowadays, it's so important to have a nice bottle. And just, you know, the front is very, very, sorry, I've got children in the background. The front is very uh, sort of calmed down and then the back is amazing. So well done. Well done. Okay, so did everyone enjoy that uh, Lumiere? I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it a little bit too much. I'm still celebrating Paddy's Day, I think. Um, but uh, uh, it is, uh, 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 it's, it's quite an eye-opener for those of you who haven't tried a white from the Rhone. 
um, because I think they are very much food wines and they're all about texture and less about aromatics. But I'm still tasting all the all the sort of flavors on that. It is it is extraordinary. Would anyone like to say anything? Oh, I have a chat. Very nice. Don't usually drink white wine. Well, hopefully Louise will get you onto a bit of a white wine trail. Uh, it is it is lovely. It's more of a red wine drinker's white wine, I think. And perhaps that's because Simon made it and he's a he's a man. Uh, <laughs> you know, they say there are masculine wines and feminine wines. I don't I'm not sure about that, but you know. Uh, I think you know I, I, just on on white roans, Harriet. I think um, yeah. you know there's a couple of things to say. We probably have um, it's the, probably the area that's developed best in the in the Southern Rhone um, in the last say 15 years. You know, there's definitely that's definitely been helped by having you know more up to date wineries and as I say, better 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 use of oak. I mean, I think of wines like the um, you know, Tyndall wine merchants importing the Domaine de Fondrèche white. You know, it's just an absolutely cracking, cracking bottle of everyday white, mm. white, white wine. And and in the past, people would have just not thought about Cote, white Cote d'Iron in, in in that way. Um, but I think just also, to, I was going to ask you a question about the age ageability. Um, one, so to age to get wines to age you know you need certain components you you need to have body you need to have acidity um, and alcohol can also help um, and then in red wine obviously we know we have we have tannins as well and um, <laughs> one of the things that um, the things that we have here are we have body and we have um, acidity and we have we have a reasonable level of, of, of alcohol. And I think I still maintain to this day that the greatest white wine I've ever tasted in my life was a very old bottle of white Chateauneuf du Pape, um, because other white, white wine producing areas, I've tasted wines after 10, 15 years and they're dead in the bottle. Um, the white Chateauneuf I'm talking about was 45 years old when I tasted it and it was just extraordinary because it had that incredible ability to age. I think that's the thing about white roan though, isn't it? Someone said to me once that you don't want to drink it between four and 10 years old. It just goes into a complete sort of sleep. Mm. Yeah, I think it could have been you, Simon. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Northern, particularly things like Marsan Roussan blends. Roussan is very temperamental. Um, and Marsan, it can go through very dumb phases where you just think, what's this all about? And then open the same bottle you know, a few years later you go, oh my God, this is just uh, sensational. Well, Simon, I th uh, how long, Simon, could you actually keep that for? Well, it's a good question because this is the first year we made it. So uh, I don't have any, any yeah, uh, yeah. recul, as they say in French, uh, but I would, I reckon that we could, you know, probably, I'd like to think six or seven years, at least. I don't that's know. If, I don't want to- if get... you can avoid drinking it, Simon. Yeah, because yeah, it is delicious yeah. at this point. It is, yeah, it's very nice, very yeah. nice. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, well, let's put glass uh, wine two into our glasses. Um, if you have that available to you, uh, we're going to have a look at this. And this is the the one that really opened my eyes to Simon, which is the Sanso uh, Le Retour. Uh, I love the way Jerome is French and he printed the tasting sheets and he translated them all to English. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the confusion in the, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was quite, I was quite amused when I opened it and went, oh, okay. Um, so, uh, so again, a lovely label um, here, which is the, uh, you tell us about the back on that, Simon, is there a story behind it? Yeah, so um, the, 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 the great story has come from um, some friends uh, who actually, you, you know, um, down in the, in the Languedoc from Paul and Isla Gordon. Um, oh really? Paul, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Paul, Paul is from Sydney, yeah. and Isla is from Carlo, um, and they run a very good domain uh, just outside Bézier, uh, in the in the Fougère appellation called Domaine La Saraband, and um, the that's actually the, the 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 vineyards there depict, in fact, where they've just built their they just built their new new winery, just where uh, it's a bit difficult to explain, but uh, if it looks like two lungs. 
the left hand corner, the corner of the left hand lung at the bottom there is where they've built their new winery. Um, so I, this is to me the great undiscovered appellation of the of of, of the Languedoc. Um, Fougere is it's about twenty starts about twenty odd kilometers west of uh, Bezier. On the, on the Mediterranean coast. And then it, it go, the hills start to rise there. And as you move up off the plain, which is kind of sandy loam, you start to get up into schist. The hills there are, are made of this kind of decomposed slate. And they have this really great long growing season. And so they're able to ripen grapes there. Uh, and I mean, all kinds of grapes, Grenache, Syrah, Sanso, Morved, and never really hit very high alcohol levels. Um, and so I was always taken by the ability of the possibility of getting grapes from here that you could, you know, you could ferment out a wine and it would be 13, 12 and a half, 13, 13 percent alcohol, um, even though we were in the south of France. So um, and we also realized early on in our days of making our domain wines, Les, Les Deux Cols, that a little bit of Sanso radically changed the blends of our, our wines. So we thought, okay, we'll give it a go making a pure, a pure Sanso. Um, and so the, so just a very quick explanation. Sanso, you can't miss it in the vineyard because it's these big fat grapes. They're much, much bigger than any of the red grapes around. Um, and when you pick them off, off the stem and eat them, they're incredibly juicy, really nice to eat and very thin skins. So it's kind of like a big Pinot Noir, um, and so we thought, okay, well, we, let's try and let's try and make something uh, Pinot Noir esque in the same idea of texture. So um, the grapes come from there. Uh, Distem. Well, I mean, I'm gonna just break in oh. a little bit because I just tasted it, and yeah, I, when you say Pinot Noir, it is your okay. The structure's a bit more. It's a bit more, the tannins are a little bit more there. It's a, it's like a sort of cross between a Nebbiolo and a Pinot Noir, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I, this is what I love about it though. It's very, it's almost stripped bare. It's very innocent in its, in its sort of uh, expression yes. um, with the tannin and the acid. And, and I think we're seeing more of grapes like Sanso and Cabernet Franc and Carmenere because they're ripening better in, since global warming has been happening. Is Absolutely. that true? Absolutely. I mean, we are, in many ways, you know, people often ask me, are you not worried about, about global warming in the Southern Rhone? And, and my response generally is actually, I think we're really well equipped to deal with it because we have grapes like Sansa, we have Carignan, which get, which we have Bourboulenc, um, which ripen, you know, they, they, they have a longer growing season, they ripen at low sugar levels and they retain really good acidity. And Sansa, you know, this kind of crunchy, crunchy red fruit, um, Oh, it's just and, delicious and real drinkability and i think you know this is it's a that drinkability is kind of a term that has been banded around a lot in the last sort of five to ten years but you know for a time we were all obsessed with these bottles of wine that were hugely muscular hugely rich um and then what you notice the practical the practical side of it is when you had bottles like that on the table at dinner and then you had something light and delicate you notice that the light and delicate one was finished way before the big muscular, you know, powerful wine. And, and I think that's why we suddenly went, oh, like a light bulb came on and we went, actually we need this, not us, but the whole wine drinking and making world switched on and went actually, you know, drinkability is a really, mm. really important factor. It's not just about showy wines, you know, it wines is. made to drink. It's quite, it's quite uh, simply refreshing, yeah. <laughs> the change yeah. in tactic and the change in wine. Um, I, I think Frank gave you a high five at some point because he, he put his, raised his hand. So if you have a question, Frank, do put it on chat, but I reckon it was a high five because the wine's so good. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I am keeping an eye on the chat, guys. Uh, I'm going to share the screen again um for the Vacquier vineyard what's grown in the Vacquier vineyard um, Vacquier is actually all is 100% Grenache okay um, so that's I'm a could be a little bit uh, premature with this but yeah. um but I just want to while we're pouring the third wine here I'd love you to um talk about the the um I was going to ask you about the Grenache varieties how old are the vines there because I know I love Grenache but I know that it, it doesn't really come into its own till the vines are of a certain age yeah. So how old are the Grenache vines in there? So the, the vines there were planted in 1979. 
Um, okay. So that makes them what? That makes yeah, them pretty old now. They're older than me now, Simon. So that's fairly old. Forty-two. Forty-two years old. <laughs> Yeah. And that is, yeah, they're hitting their, they're hitting their, their stride um, by that stage. Yeah. You know, they, young vines are capable of producing lots of fruit and can be, can be interesting, but because their root system hasn't really developed, you don't get any of that real intensity. Um, mm. And what, but once they're now at sort of 42 and they can go on, you know, we have, as I said, we have some vines planted in 1947, you know, and there are vines, as you know, there are Grenache vines around the world, which are, you know, 100 plus. And, and the fruit from these vines as they get older is just immense. Because I, you know, there's Grenache and there's Grenache. Like, I know we're, we're on the Sanso at the moment, but, you know, we'll dive up. Uh, but, you know, you try a young Grenache and it just tastes of raspberries and strawberries and it's high alcohol it hasn't got any acidity and you're just sitting there going what's so special it's when you get the Grenache from these old vines with these sort of piquant raspberry tones that minerality in the core that deep dark kind of brooding kind of red oh well we're going to try a couple later so we'll discuss it then yeah. but yeah. um but uh so so that's the Vacchia vineyard there yeah um, that, that, that's it again from so yeah. the first photo was from the terraces Looking, looking eastwards, and now this is from the end where we enter into the vineyard, looking um, westwards. Um, and, and this is an interesting photo, actually, just because. Can we quick? Can I? Is it okay if I just quickly yeah. talk about? So, yeah. um, am I going left or right? I'll go back again. <laughs> no, you just actually just go there. Yeah, that I thought I was your Debbie for a minute, and you wanted me to change slides. You know, <laughs> come on, Paul, keep going. So, yeah. <laughs> um, this is a vineyard that we bought from a very nice uh, guy uh, who is in our village who is a member of the cooperative um, and the cooperative system you know ha has worked very well for a long time in France well sorry it's worked well up to a point in the last perhaps the last 20 years it's been it's been a bit in crisis um, you know and it's it, the, the idea is good in that you know you you might have anything from 10 to 200 local growers who take their grapes to this one winemaking facility. The wine is made there into different, different, different wines and then they are paid um, out for their, their, their grapes. The, the difficulty with the system is that um, a lot of it has been about volume. So mm. they get paid per kilo of grapes and, per, and by degree of alcohol. So that the aim of a sort of, of a lot of people in the system is to basically just produce the largest number of grapes they can in the vineyard and they don't really watch too much about how, how the alcohol level is going they're quite happy for it to go go very high so to achieve a maximum yield that you're going to get from a vineyard you know being being growing organically or biodynamically doesn't really make a lot of sense so they tend to be conventional farmers who will use conventional sprays, systemic sprays, and then to nourish the vineyards, they'll, you know, every, every few years, they'll put fertilizer on and that will help, you know, keep the yields high. But it does ultimately shorten the life of the vineyard because the, the vines are, are basically knackered after, you know, after, after a certain time. So this photograph was taken just um, after we pruned it. Um, so you just as a point of interest, you never get to buy a vineyard after pruning. A, 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 someone will only ever sell it to you before pruning, because pruning is the major work of the year. Um, so if you've pruned a vineyard, you won't sell it until you've actually taken the crop off it. So we had bought this just before the Christmas um, of 2019 and pruned it. And then what we're doing here is so in the rows which aren't being ploughed, you may notice that just under the vines, it's it's lighter coloured and it's slightly stony, and you can also see see that it looks quite the ground looks quite hard, and this is because since this vineyard was planted, it had, it had never been ploughed. Um, so the what what the what the vineyard owner would do is they would come in and then they would spray under the vines to re remove any weeds, so herbicides in. And then they would mow the middle strip where the green grass is. Um, it makes it makes access for tractors very easy because the, the ground is very compacted. Um, and by spraying 
uh, herbicides, obviously you've got no problem with, with weeds. Um, but we farm organically. And so what, the, what we're doing here for the first time is actually just plowing the soil. So this is the first time since 1979 that these vineyards would have been, would have been plowed. And the interesting thing is that the, the vineyard, when you do that to it, 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 it's like, what the hell is going on? What are you doing to me? You know, we, we were quite happy getting our dose of, of fertilizer, you know, every couple of years. And then, then the, 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 weed, the weed killer is going on. Um, and you know, we're happy producing very high yields. And now here you come along, you change the pruning system, you start plowing the soils. Where's our, where's our, where's our nitrogen? Uh, you know, where's our, where are our drugs? And the change actually in the first year, the vines kind of go, oh, we don't really like that. But then two or three years later, they go, oh, actually now we kind of get it. We feel healthier. Um, you know, we feel more relaxed. There's more of a kind of natural thing going on here. And the, and the quality of the fruit is better, but the yield drops naturally as well. I think, you know, you'll, you're on a winner, Simon, according, this is to, according to a, the sort of, you know, the biodynamic man, Rudolf Trossen, when you walk from one vineyard into yours and you feel like you're walking on air, when you get that yeah. sort of, that all the worms working so well underneath that there's so much air that you feel like you're walking on a, 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 a sort of spongy lawn. That's what, that's what you're aiming for, yeah, Simon? No, I think you nailed it in one, actually. What we, the, the sign that your things are coming back is the, the sudden, you have loads more earthworms suddenly at work yeah. because, because the soil's breathing. And so they can, they, can, they can get to work and they can help break up the, uh, the soil structure for you. But they can't do that when, you know, when, when it's compacted like it was. So organic farm equals less yield. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. organics definitely, they less yield. It's more expensive to do. Uh, it's harder work, isn't it, Simon? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You have to be much more vigilant um, yeah. because we are, you know, our vines are exposed to disease pressure much more uh, than if you use systemic sprays. And actually, that's what we were going to talk about here, because you're surrounded by trees. And in my um, my initial thought was, gosh, you must have because I love pigs. You must have lots of wild boar that come in. You must have deer that come in. Um, you know, you you the the sort of pests that you are affected by being in the wilderness here. Um, what's your biggest problem out there? Yeah, I mean, the def definitely. So you, you know, you can see from the photograph. You know, we're we're sitting at the top of these this range of hills, and we uh, I think we have eight eight we have well, we have we have eight hectares of vineyard, but I think we also own six hectares of woodland, um, and so there's great it's great biodiversity, but the biggest pests are wild boar. Mm. Um, they it's not that they necessarily do damage to the plants themselves. Um, they do like to root up uh, the soil. So as they're looking for earthworms and things like that. So the, the problem there is if you're driving along in a tractor and then your front wheel goes down into a great dirty, great hole that they've dug in the middle of the row, it, it, it's not too funny. But um, the biggest problem really is as we get close to harvest and as the grapes start to get full of sugar, they love, they love to eat the grapes. Yeah. Um, and, so they and in, in the old days, all the old lads used to go out and shoot the wild boar and then eat them. But nowadays, the young people have all emigrated or migrated to the cities uh, and they're all working in cities. Well, COVID sort of put paid to that, but, you know, they were. Uh, maybe they'll all come and shoot wild boar instead of uh, working in cities. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, we, we actually have a we have a a, 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 um, a, a, a uh, what's well, called the cabin de chasseur it's a, it's, a, it's a hunter's hut in the corner of our Peugeot vineyard and um it was there before we 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 bought the vineyard and the local hunters use it as their base for for hunting the wild boar and i'm not as i've got older i, I don't really don't like killing things but oh, simon uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but the the just, actually just as a, a i can taste the wild boar sausages while we're talking about them, you know <laughs> just as a I mean... <laughs> just as a brief aside um they reckon that today the wild boar population needs to be in france needs to be culled by about two hundred thousand just to bring it under control yeah. um so you know we have a lot we have a lot running around the place um, so that's, they are definitely our biggest challenge. And you can't really, you know, if you, that, that Vacchia vineyard is 2.8 hectares inside, in size, you know, you, you, 
you can't really fence it off. I've seen people doing in, in places like the UK, putting up deer fencing. You know, it's a massive, massive, massive cost. cost yeah. Um, uh, I know that Julian in Clos del Rey down the road in the Roussillon, mm. uh, he's investing in a huge fence around his whole uh, estate because he just couldn't cope with it. And he's situated rather like you in, in, in amongst the trees. And yeah, he, he, that's cost is crippling. I'd say we'll see a few cent put on each bottle because of the feckin' fence. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, you have to make a choice, don't you? You have to make yeah. a decision. Uh, we're going to rather rudely and abruptly interrupt our French tasting and switch to Spain just for a while, uh, just for one slide, um, because we have, you, you're not only a winemaker in France, you had sort of thoughts of great Spanish tapas and decided that uh, Monastrel was going to be your next grape variety. Um, so tell us a little bit about this, Simon. So um, in, in 2016, um, uh, Turin Company um, was acquired by Tyndall, Tyndall Wine Merchants, your family company, Harriet. So um, and one, of the, one of the things that uh, when I was talking to your dad that we decided that would be interesting to do was to explore the possibility of making wine um, for, for the company. I mean, you're already doing it in, in South Africa and in Chile. Um, but we thought we'd try try something closer to home. So um, we, yeah, you, uh, Tinder Wine Merchants as a company, and, and I had uh, connections to a family-owned estate down in a place called Jekla, or Yekla, which is about an hour and a quarter's drive northwest of Alicante um, on the road to Madrid. And it's a fascinating area because it's... It, it's very high altitude. It goes from 750 meters at the bottom of the valley um, up to a thousand meters at the top of the valley. And, and the thing that people may not be aware of, but the reason we like altitude, things, the reason we're interested in altitude is because for every hundred meters you go up, you drop 0.6 of a degree Celsius in temperature. So at a thousand meters, you're six degrees cooler than, than, than you would be at sea level. And so in a winemaking sense, that's really interesting because we get, we get better acidities, we get better color, um, et cetera. So um, in 2016, uh, I went here on behalf of, of, of Tinder Wine Merchants to make a, um, a Monastrel, which is Monastrel is the Spanish version of Morverde, which is what they, they predominantly grow down here. Um, and, uh, so in the, and then in that that project then evolved on 2017, 18, and 19 to then making a high altitude uh, garnacha um, in another area, uh, which is just west of Madrid, an area called the Sierra de, Sierra de Grados. Um, it's really exciting. Yeah, um, it's a, I think it's you know the project's got really great potential, and I think that also mm -hmm. what it's able to do is ex is really explore some of the very 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 exciting viticultural areas in, in Spain. And they are, um, I think it's perhaps because of forgotten vines and generations, but there's a lot of old vines out there, aren't there? Um, yeah. They deal with the drought better as well, don't they? Because that's the right. Roots. I mean, you can see how in this picture, the, the vines are very close to the, the, the ground. There's no point to have the vines train very high because they don't need to go looking for sun. Sun is, you know, bountiful down here. Um, and so the, these are old, old Monastrel vines. And I think what also is interesting to note, if you compare them to the previous vineyard shot, is the spacing between the vines um, is much greater. And that's because they only get about 300 millimeters of rain annually down here. So the, 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 the land can only, can only provide for, uh, a far, for far fewer vines than, than they can up where we are in, in the Rhone. And the soil is rather like having a white car, isn't it, Simon? Because the soil, instead of absorbing the heat and making the vine hotter, it actually sort of reflects back the heat uh, and keeps the vines and the roots quite cool. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. I, I love this picture because it looks like it's probably one of the hottest days Arlen would see in the summer, but they're all in their jumpers. <laughs> and this, this is in October. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you yeah. Know how, how late they harvest there because of the altitude you know you think you think um southeastern spain geez they must be harvesting in mid-august this is this is october 
because that altitude makes all that difference. And this place is it's just fascinating. These guys have 550 hectares of vineyard and everything is done by hand. Yeah, it is amazing. It is amazing. But again, that's the, the whole um, labor is a lot cheaper in Spain. Yeah. Um, where does most of the Spanish labor comes from? Is it from, from Ecuador? Yeah. OK, yeah. so they come in because they're Spanish speakers and they're, they're going to get money for harvest. So yeah. that's another thing that's been affected massively by COVID, obviously, is um, uh, the sort of uh, labor supply into these wine regions. Yeah. And, um, you know, I hate referring to COVID, but it's part of life now. Uh, and uh, and the fact that um, disruption is not just the sale of wine or the export of wine, it's also getting labor and being able to harvest your wine. Because Simon, you, you've just, you, I'm sorry to touch on it, but you actually caught COVID in France when you went out to check your vineyards. So, you know, the, Simon's a frontline worker so that we can drink and enjoy his wines. Um, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's made it very difficult this year, hasn't it? Yeah, no. I, look, I mean, if I, I went on a on a trip that I thought was only going to be a week. I wanted to go and see some barrel makers in cognac, um, and then had some stuff to do at the domain, and caught COVID um, whilst traveling in a car with somebody, and uh, yeah, and then ended up ended up. I didn't get home until the twenty first of February, as a result. Did you, and did you get all your pruning done? Uh, so pretty yeah. yeah so we just brought everything forward um it's we we like to prune late and there's a reason for that it's for avoiding avoiding late spring frosts um and the the, the later there's a theory that the later you prune now you know you you're you can uh, avoid some of the real intense heat of the uh, earlier in the season by the plant flowering flowering later um but no, you're absolutely right, Harry. It's become it's become a real challenge because uh, I know not just for us. There's, there are there are a lot of migrant workers who come into France and other European countries for for the for the fruit season. You know, it's not just grapes; it's cherries and and other other fruit. Um, and they weren't able. It was very difficult to to travel. Um, and I only managed to get out three times last year. Now each time was for a good good stint. Um, but it, it certainly rendered things very difficult, and we, we, we're lucky. We have a we have a a guy. We rent a winery there, a winery space. The guy who just retired, and we we took over his winery, and he um, he was one of the founding members of one of the founders of Millezim Bio, which is the big organic wine fair that's held every year, and he's been an organic grower since 1972. So he's a real pioneer of organics, same kind of era as Rudolf Trossen. Mm. Um, and so we were able to fall back on him to help us with the spraying and, and, and other, other vineyard work. Yeah. Simon, yeah. did you say what type of soil that was? So most of the soil here, John, is it's on a, on a limestone, limestone base, but it's quite a friable, um, there's a bit of loam in there as well. Right. Okay, thank you. And just before we leave Spain, did you find it uh, a real adjustment to start making wine in Spain? As you said, with the Rhone, you have a lot of ingredients. You have a lot of different grape varieties in Spain. You're just dealing with Monastrell or Grenache. You're not blending. Um, did you find it was quite an adjustment? Uh, it, it, yeah, I think it that's good. You? That's a good question. I, I think what's perhaps more, more of a challenge is to work with the... Um, preconceived um, ideas that, that the local people have in, in different areas. So, you know, winemaking traditions in, in these countries have been going on for centuries and we, we're just, you know, blow-ins. Um, and so, but, but the difference is that we come, and when I say we, I say people who, you know, worked with wine as perhaps wine importers and wine distributors, we come, we come in it with a very different uh, idea because we have generally tasted a lot around the place, you know, uh, all over the world, wines from all over the world. You have to remember that in a lot of these places, the, the reference point is what has been produced locally and what's always been produced locally. Um, and I think the, the greatest challenge I found in Spain was about trying to get people to understand about harvesting a little bit earlier. Um, so the, the success that they have had has often been based on, on late harvested uh, grapes. Really ripe, yeah. Kind of raisiny 
character and to say to them actually i want you know we want to try and harvest probably two weeks earlier they're going no 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 you're, you're that's crazy you know nothing simon yeah. <laughs> And so and and so I think they probably spit into your drink at lunchtime. Yeah. And yeah. they're kind of looking at you just absolutely crazy. Um and also I think it's interesting to note that you know we we look upon wine as a sort of as very much as a as a quality thing. You know, wine is is a aspirational in many ways, you know, um and it's and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um and 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 we don't have that real wine long you know in integrated into our culture uh, of, is we don't have that wine drinking um thing but in these places wine isn't really perceived in that way wine is perceived as an agricultural crop that provides a drink and that drink goes with goes with a meal but it's not necessarily taken to levels above that so they look at us sometimes and go what are you what are you what are you talking about what are you trying to do you know you're doing something that's just a bit it's not very traditional. So that's the challenge, mm. I think, more than anything. Yeah. Well, let's move on to wine number four, uh, which is La Traversée. Uh, what did Jerome translate it as on the, uh, on the sheet? Hold on a sec. Oh, no, he didn't translate it. <laughs> <laughs> can I, Harry, can I just very quick, I did, uh, questions, I've seen some questions come up. Do you, yeah, we do the that wax later, seal. Or? Yeah, no, do the wax seal one, actually. That's uh, I did, I mean, Simon I'm, asked about the wax, the other Simon asked about the wax seal. What was the question? I missed that one. Uh, why do you have it? And I, I was mentally thinking he's just he's being a little bit aspirational in his in his uh, packaging. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 all about the look. Um, yeah. No, I mean look, there, there is a there is a uh, you know a theory. It's a very good way of sealing. Obviously, we get oxygen ingress into the bottle via the cork. Um, and traditional capsules work well, but what what stops? Uh, you know, we're trying to limit the amount of oxygen going in via the cork. A really good way of sealing the bottle is by using uh, wax, and it just looks deadly as well. So, um, yeah. but it looks the part. But it's a pain to do. It's a pain in the hole to do. Um, it's a pain to open as well, Simon. Yeah, I if know, you're in look, a hurry, Jesus, but, get me that drink now. <laughs> But it looks great, Harry, so don't worry about it. Um, no, the, the yeah. other question I saw come up was about there organics. Go. Oh, yeah, there you go. We can do about, you can do about a thousand bottles a day. Um, From? Doing that. You okay. dot with the wax. Oh, with the, oh, I was thinking, I was thinking, what's he talking about with organics? What? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, the organic thing I saw a question come up was about the quality. Is Are, are organic wines better? Would that is a very um, subjective thing as I, I go back to what i said at the beginning which was that um just because you're a good grape grower doesn't necessarily make you a good winemaker just because you're a good winemaker doesn't necessarily make you a good grape grower and just because you grow organically it doesn't necessarily make your wine better but in theory the quality of the fruit that you're going to get is generally more interesting because we, with 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 the change in the way that the vine reacts, um, we generally end up with 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 lower pH levels, higher acidity, and that gives us better balance. And I think that's what's really interesting. Apart, leaving aside the environmental factors, that's what's that's the really interesting thing as a winemaker. It's worth, on a less serious note, Googling Cameron Diaz and her clean wine. Uh, she did a YouTube video about the fact that organic wine was all boring and just doesn't really taste great. But did you know that they don't wash their grapes before they bring them into the winery? It's just so dirty. So she makes clean wines and she washes her grapes. Uh, it's just, it's unbelievable. And this went out to millions of people. So millions of people think that organics wine is boring and you should wash your grapes before they come into the winery but it's just a little add-on with that one if you wash your grapes before they come into the winery then you don't have the bloom do you simon and on the bloom are the native yeasts which you use to start a natural fermentation um, so washing your grapes is like sterilizing I don't know. yeah basically exactly yeah. it's like having camembert with which is pasteurized or yeah. you know it's exactly. yeah yeah, well, you know, so that was a little uh, side. So I'm going to share the screen again. We've got um, we've got wine four, which is the Traversé, uh, and this is from your own vineyards. No, no. Oh, this this is, um, <laughs> this, is uh, this comes from a friend's vineyard on the on the other side of the the Rhone. 
hence the name um, La Traversée. Ah, Traversée. Oui. So the crossing. <laughs> um, so we, I think one of the things that um, I referred to earlier was that, um, you know, the Southern Road, well, so I didn't actually say it, the Southern Road is a very large area and um, there are a lot of growers there. Um, the whole of the road is 78,000 hectares. So it's like 78,000 Lansdowne Road pitches in size. Um, and uh, a lot of people struggle to sell their wines and obviously particularly in the last, in the last uh, you know, uh, year. Um, and in areas like Champagne and Burgundy, it's quite common to find pe people who buy grapes from other growers because I say you don't always get people who make good wine just because they make good grapes. And so it's a coming thing in the Southern Rhone. And in, in Atelier, um, through our connections, we were able to source some really interesting grapes. And these, this is a, a blend of 60% Carignan and 40% Grenache. And it comes from a friend's vineyard on the other side of the Rhone in a place called Toulette, which is a very interesting village north of Keran. So you're kind of in the northern part of the southern southern Rhone. Um, he's an organic grower, but he's actually in the last few years been converting, converting to biodynamics. So um, and he's actually he's actually a good winemaker, but he's a terrible salesman. So he he sells us grapes. Um, so we go over there with our own team and we harvest the grapes and then bring them back. It's about a 35 minute ride um and we make the wines in our own in our own winery then and the reason that simon talks about the fact it's a 30 um five minute ride is that um uh uh obviously if your grapes are being transported around the place the hotter it is the more open they are to oxidation on the journey to the winery so the harder job you have to make quality wine at the end of it um isn't that right simon yeah exactly yeah exactly and and you know we um it, it, you know, we that van you see down at the bottom of the photograph there is what we transport the grapes in. So um, we can get about sixty bins in at any time. So it's we're doing several several runs across across the Rhone um, each each day to get the grapes. Uh, but we think it's worth it because we you know we we're able to pick out what we think are really interesting vineyards, really interesting growers, and um, and and buy grapes from us. And and and, and as I think it's worth also saying that as 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 importers, people who've been involved in the importing business, and you you, you know this, Harriet, there's, you have this sort of endless curiosity about other wines. Um, and I think if you said to me, all you're ever going to make is just the wines that come from the, your eight hectares of vineyard, I'd kind of go, okay, that that's great. But I would be, I'd have this nagging feeling of or a bit disappointment that I a bit disappointed that I couldn't go and try other things at the same time so Atelier helps in, in that respect as well yeah exactly well uh your friend your your other Simon Simon is saying that it's holding up very well with state free I'm really hungry Simon so please don't <laughs> talk about food just yet <laughs> um yeah lucky Simon um and uh <laughs> Yeah. Just very quickly, so to, to make this wine, we actually take the, the, the grapes off their stems um, because the we want to get that kind of very fruity, fruit forward style and stems, we sometimes leave stems in. We did in the Spanish wine and we will in the, in the next two wines we're going to taste. And um, But they can give a little bit of kind of grippy character. But when you take the stem, when you take the grapes off their stems, it helps to give this kind of rounder, uh, more accessible, accessible mouthfeel as well. And, and also with Carignan, and Carignan is like one of my new favorite grape varieties, um, mm. but it is quite difficult to manage the tannins with Carignan. So if you had stems in the balance there as well, it would make it even more sort of uh, grippy and um, firm yeah. on the palate, wouldn't it? Good, good, good point, because uh, young Carignan in particular is, is kind of naturally gives a sort of herbaceous character. And so if you then throw stems in on top of that, if, you, if people can imagine, you know, stems go from being green and as they ripen, they go to yellow and then eventually they, they start to turn to wood, they lignify, they go brown. But if you get, if you've got young Carignan herbaceous and then you throw in green stems on top, you're going to get more 
more vegetal character. You so carignan is best when it's very old vines um, before you think about putting any stems in. Um, I think, and also for those of you who are expecting a sort of typical Grenache Syrah blend, uh, uh, Simon, you know, obviously this is his style. He's he's a good enough winemaker to have a style now. Uh, <laughs> and it's quite textural, quite lifted with the acid, nice minerality running through it. And you can't really gather that, um, you know, trialing with sort of with a dominance of Carignan or Carignan, you say it so much better than I do. Uh, um, it, it, it really gives you this, this style and it's lovely. It's really, really lovely. And I made a mental note that when um, I start getting my friends who drink quite a lot around, um, they, they're gonna be treated to this because it's <laughs> utterly, utterly delicious, you know? Um, it's nice to spend time over your wines like this, Simon. I'm enjoying this. I hope everyone else is. Um, uh, so uh, uh, am I still screen sharing? I'm sort of, you know, enjoying the tasting too much. I feel like like a guest. Uh, um, the dark soils, I just want to touch on the dark, dark soils in this vineyard. Yeah, so th this is this is Peugeot, as I said earlier, and Peugeot is a very has a very complex soil structure, even though it's a relatively small, small vineyard. Um, uh, this is the bottom of the vineyard, um, but behind us and actually to the right, um, we move off a, a, a tree line and coming down the first part is what's called um, a soil called loss, L-O-E-S-S. -S. And that is a kind of windblown um, dust that compacts uh, limestone um, and uh, forms this sort of hard, harder, harder uh, surface. And then as we move down to where these rows are, um, it, we start to get more loam in it. And, and that's what's bringing the brown, the brown darker character. But as we move, uh, if you go down towards where the van is, which is at the bottom of the vineyard, in fact, it's a far richer, more clay type soil. And we get a lot more vigor down at the bottom where the van is. Uh, we get much more, much more um, leaf production. Uh, it's a more tricky part of the vineyard to work because the bunches get shaded. And if you start stripping back the leaves uh, and, and the shoots, the vine reacts to that. It goes, oh, Jesus Christ, I've got to produce more, um, more leaves and more, more shoots. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you struggle even further to get to, 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 to ripen the grapes. So in fact, what we may do in time is we may move some of that heavier soil at the bottom where the van is a bit further up up the slope. Um, but as we traverse across and go go left, go eastwards, it becomes actually very sandy. And sandy soils are really interesting for Grenache or any any kind of light soil. So like a, if you, in the Sierra de Grados in Spain, they have this kind of very friable granite. Um, and here we have sand and you, it, it gives this kind of very perfumed, uh, almost Pinot-like quality to, to, to Grenache, which makes, uh, which I think is sort of a very interesting, interesting aspect. But the, the flip side of that is of course that um, the soils are so well drained that they don't hold water very well. So you can, you can get more hydric stress in the lighter soils than you can in the heavier soils. Mm. And do you, have you got to the point where you're so exacting in your winemaking, Simon, that you're harvesting each section of each plot into different van loads and labeling them and putting them in different vats when you get to the winery? Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might be. <laughs> We're completely aiming about it. So you, we, um, and particularly in the Pigeon vineyard, because it's so, it's so, it's such a complex vineyard. In fact, the final wine we're going to taste tonight is a parcel selection, or is almost a row by row selection of Pigeon. But we spend an awful lot of time at harvest time, at the end of the day, going back into the vineyards and tasting, just picking bunches, picking, picking berries off bunches and, and tasting. At, now, this photograph I put in, okay, because I, I wanted to talk, this is actually not our vineyard, this is a... While uh, Simon's explaining this, if you pour wine number five into your glasses, um, we'll talk about that well after Simon's explained this. Sorry, Simon, to interrupt. Yeah, no, I wanted to show you this vineyard because this is a friend's vineyard. That That's our tractor, um, but this is his... Very vineyard. smart, Simon. Oh yeah, class, yeah, which is... Owned, good owned class. By, owned by class Renner. is class, yeah. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, this is on a 
plateau uh, in an area called uh, Venijan, which is a little bit to the east from us and a little bit closer to the Rhone River. And the reason I wanted to show this photograph was because just by the tractor wheels, you'll notice um, it's very stony. And these are what uh, the classic pictures you'll often see of the southern Rhone of these stones, which are called uh, Galley Roule. And Galley Roule were a quartz, they made a quartz and they were left behind by an alpine glacier that, that receded many millions of years ago. And then they were washed by the sea um, and then by the Rhone. And, and so they get, they're, they're round and, and very smooth. And it's interesting because 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it used to be this sort of the, the, the iconic picture of, of the Southern Rhone was, was vineyards covered in these stones. And they were highly prized and people would, you do your, you know, your wine learning classes and people would say, the great thing about these stones is that they take in the heat of the day, uh, heat of the sun during the day, and they radiate that heat back out at night. And that helps, you know, bring extra ripeness to the grapes. <clears throat> and I think that the interesting thing today is people are moving away from these vineyards because they just, you, your grapes are now getting so super ripe um, that that's why I say we're looking for sandy, sandy soil, sand, gravel, loose granite, that kind of things, which give us, give, which don't retain heat um, during the night. In fact, the heat escapes during the night. And so we get, we get better freshness. Yeah, no. Um, so yeah, well, I, I used to I used to love that part when I was teaching where I'd talk about the big galley. And yeah, I've definitely pulled back on that because people are like, why do you want a hotter vineyard in the Southern Rhone? Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so so we're on to um, wine number five, which is Les Trois Terroirs. Yes. Um, tell us about this wine, Simon. This is from you your Les Deux Col range. Yeah. So this is from the this is from the domain. Uh, in fact, this is our first wine from the domain. So our eight, eight hectare domain, organic farming. Um, and 2000, this comes from the 2019 vintage. And 2019 was a, was a very interesting vintage because um, I don't know if people remember, but in June, we had uh, a week where the temperatures got up to 50 degrees. Um, and then that was, they dropped back again. And then in July, we had another spike where the temperatures went back up to 50 degrees again. Um, now, that's not a huge problem in the sense that the, <clears throat> the, the really important part of the grape growing period is the last 30 days before harvest. And that's what really dictates the key bits, the amount of sugar, acidities, and things like that. But what it did mean is we, had, we also had very little rain. Um, and so what we ended up with in 2019 were these very small berries. Um, and very small berries mean thick skins and not very much juice. So this is why vintage variation is, is, is interesting and a challenge as a winemaker, because you have to look at each why each vintage in its own in its own way so 2019 let's say presents us with these very small berries fixed and so we have to say we have to think differently about how we're going to do this than we would have done it in 2018 or 17 or or, or whatever um and we made the wines from our different vineyards and when we came to the end of the winemaking process our one of our cuvées alizé we thought was just we were absolutely delighted sensational but the wine that was normally goes to be our top cuvee, Chemin des Fonds, wasn't at all representative of what we wanted to do normally with Chemin des Fonds. So, and then we tried a blend of the two together and we said, actually the blend of the two together is better than each of the component parts. So we decided to create a new cuvee called Les Trois Terroirs. Uh, ah, I didn't know that story, Simon. I'm such yeah. a good student, aren't I? Not. <laughs> So it's the only it's the only wine we produce. We only produce one wine from the domain in 2019. Yeah. 2020, we'll be back to Alize and Chemin des Fonds. So the entry and then the top, but the Trois Terroirs will continue to exist well, as well. 
I, I think you've done exceptionally well. It's delicious. Um, I love the fact that there is a sort of course of minerality that runs through the wine that just carries it through on a, what was a difficult and, as you say, quite a desiccated vintage. Yeah. Um, so we we I mean, we so we had this is this is eighty percent Grenache, twelve Carignan, and then the rest is a blend of Sanso, Syrah, and there's some um, there's some Claret in there as well. Mm -hmm. And 50% of it was aged in wood and 50% in, in tank. Um, and what really pleases me about this wine is you get, well, hopefully you get the finesse of the uh, winemaking style, but you will see the vintage on the finish where the tannins are, are they're noticeable on the, on the finish, but what's good about them is that they're fruit tannins. So they're, it's drying on the front of your teeth. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not wood tannins and that, those will evolve over time and um, and also it, make, it makes it a very fruit food friendly wine as well. Yeah, no, well, it's absolutely delicious. And we haven't really spoken about um, oak on the wines. So we'll actually talk about that on the sort of one of the last um, slides mm. on the breads anyway. But I've just got another slide with a picture of the um, soil. If I, here we go, the soil texture. Um, which vineyard is that underneath? So, um, yeah, so this is this this is um, one of Not the. Not quite sure, Harriet. <laughs> no, no, this is one of the three vineyards that goes into making the Trois Terroirs. So this is a parcel called um, Plom Bouquet, which is a. If you come and visit, it's actually it's gorgeous. We have an olive grove there as well that belongs to us, um, and it's quite. Well, I'm desperate to come and do a, a week of harvest. Mm -hmm. uh, I might uh, I might bring my children to sub in when it's sort of lunchtime and I want to do wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is this is a this is this is a really good example of the kind of, of some of the soils we have around the area. Um, so you'll see that that layer of limestone subsoil, and then there's a, a layer of clay, loamy clay, which is quite rich in iron oxide, hence the the, the reddy color, and then these limestone chips on the on the surface. So the, as the vine goes in, it can draw water out of that that clay loam um, layer and then it forces its way down through those through the that, that that big layer of limestone and in doing so you know we'll pick up interesting minerals and nutrients from the subsoil as well it is fascinating how vine roots can go up to sort of eight or nine meters below the surface and find a water table that you wouldn't imagine is there yeah um yeah. they are amazing you know people talk about wine and talk about how the diversity is quite impressive or there are so many different styles and so many great varieties but just the actual work of the vine is just quite quite amazing um yeah i mean i i i've, I've tasted I have the opportunity to taste grapes from irrigated vineyards and non-irrigated vineyards next door and for me there's qualitatively there's no there's no comparison you know the non-irrigated vineyards are are the grape quality is just Inherently and, that's, and that's because the roots go straight down don't they and they pick up all the minerals and all the you know soil structure is the further the deeper you go the older it is so you know you go right down to sort of millions and millions hundreds of millions of year old soil and the sort of you know the memory in that soil the minerals the fossil deposits uh, the marine life the the animal life that's underneath there that the vine is connecting with is all translated into what's in your glass and you know, it is it is absolutely amazing. You could turn into a real soil nerd, actually. That's my latest thing, soil. Uh, um, and, and you know, just to touch on that little soil um, aside, because I'm not very good at keeping on the point when I find something that I was sort of looking at, is, um, is the microorganisms in the soil and the activity of them is hugely important. And, and actually, as a whole, sort of with climate change and global warming, people are realizing that they're, they're key to sort of uh, maintaining uh, some kind of uh, stability in climate change. And um, carbon sequ sequestering, which is holding on to the carbon, can be maintained in soil. Soil is hugely important. There we go. That's my little shaking the flag for soil, isn't it, Simon? Simon's like, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and and it's it's a very it requires a lot of thought, and it's a very complex um, subject because you can't just assume that you know you do one thing. 
the situations change in the vineyard all the time and from year to year and you know you may want to add in some kind of leguminous plants but that you may have a suddenly have a very dry year and, and actually your vines are going to suffer because the the plants are taking taking uh, taking water from the vine so it's it's a very it's a very complex um, but fascinating subject so when you decided to be a winemaker Simon did you realize that you would have to actually in effect just become a jumped up gardener <laughs> You know what? It's really interesting because we we moved two years ago to to Wicklow Town and we don't really have a garden anymore. And um, and uh, we used to we used to have quite a big garden, and I was a useless gardener. Um, and uh, I just I, I'm quite good at doing the heavy shifting stuff, but just the, the intricacy of of you know I, I know I've seen your you know your mother's garden. It's spectacular. Um, I'm not very good at that. And, and today I might have this excuse. I say, we, we have 32,000 vines on our property. And, you know, when it comes to pruning other plants, I really don't want to know when I get home, you know, I've done my bit. Um, and I love the whole vine bit, but gardening, no, it's not my... Uh, it's but not I think, I can't think of, like, I, I like gardening, but in my veg garden. So I'm thinking vines is a whole different level of satisfaction. You can drink an amazing juice from your vines. I mean, you know, I'd be like a sort of, like, you know, who was that uh, cartoon character? Meep, meep, <laughs> just pruning the vines so that I'm thinking about that bottle that I would have at the end of it, you know? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> the road runner that's it yeah honestly my, my work as a gardener I drive by my house and you see the roses that we have out the front have been beautifully beautifully pruned as i would prune a vine so whether yeah. that's going to work or not i don't know but just uh, well let me know because my roses are a little bit errant at the moment so um we can compare discussions on that let's uh, pour the final wine into our glass um wine number six which is oh hitting the shelves here, which is the Chemin de France. So this is the one you didn't make in 2019. This is the yeah. 2018 vintage. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I'll let you talk about the uh, grapes that go into that. But just as a little uh, aside here on the um, PowerPoint, we have uh, obviously the small baskets which you collect the grapes in. And the fact that you're collecting them hand picking and in bunches, that gives you more choice on whether you're going to use bunches or berries in the fermentation and a whole bunch for anyone who wants to so doesn't quite understand it is basically a choice where if you have the berries going in with a whole bunch it means that you can use the stems to add a little bit of um well what do they do they add a little bit of freshness a little bit of sort of herbaceous notes uh but also they can take away from the acidity can't they simon so so it's a really difficult choice whether to use your stems, to use your whole bunches, or to de-stem as you do on, which was it the Sanso you de-stemmed on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and La Traverse, yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a very good point. I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons for harvesting by hand and harvesting into these small, what we call cagettes, they hold about 13, 13 kilos of grapes. Um, is because we it gives us choice when when we get to the winery, so we can decide to crush the grapes and or destem them or leave them whole bunch. Um, we have all the options open to us. Whereas if you if you if you harvest by machine, the grapes are all destemmed, so you, you you lose that you lose that option. Although you go a lot quicker, so it takes us uh, takes us about a day to do one hectare of vineyard by hand uh, with. The team of eight, eight to ten harvesters uh, a machine will do it in 45 minutes so it's um you know there are there are advantages to the machine um but yeah and you can see from these photographs particularly the one on the right the green stems there we, we wouldn't yeah, include oh yeah that's that's us putting it into the into the destemmer um so green stems we would tend to avoid putting in because we'd get those herbaceous notes as i mentioned earlier and if we go to put stems in, we generally would pick bunches that have got uh, where the stems have, 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 gone, have gone yellow. Um, Perhaps the speed of um, uh, harvesting is because you have lads like Killian in the in the in the vineyard who are you know the chat is going to be mighty, but the work might not be as uh, uh, <laughs> as quick. It's lovely, like the whole of the whole of Ireland moves out to the Rhone Valley at harvest time. Uh, you wouldn't hear yeah. a French accent in the place. 
No, he and actually Killian, Killian's been with us for three years, and in fact, he in last year he he made his his own wine with us. Um, he wants to try his hand. He's actually going to be a very talented winemaker. He's um he's he's got it. You know, when people yeah. come to the winery, they've either got it or they don't, and he mm. absolutely has it. Um, oh, that's cool. So uh, yeah, he's, he's we've given him the opportunity to try try a hand at, at doing something himself. Um, so yeah, so that, that's those are the grapes going into the into the crush of the stemmer. So um, Chemin des Fonds is uh, I mentioned it earlier. It's it's a, it's a parcel, a single parcel of vineyard, the Pigeot vineyard, which was the one with the van photograph of the van parked at the bottom. But within that, it's a selection. So every night as I mentioned, Charles and I would be out in the vineyard and we would be working our way through the rows, tasting the grapes. And as it's such a varied vineyard, um, we literally say, okay, we put a stake in the ground and say from this point of the row down to say another 50 meters further down, we're going to harvest that tomorrow and three rows across, then we'll stop and go back to it, you know, um, uh, maybe three or four days later or sometimes a, a week later a harvesters find it an absolute pain because uh, they just want to do it in one go and they hate moving around from parcel to parcel but it's just really important in this particular vineyard so um i so say we do this very meticulous selection and uh 2018 it has pretty it's similar to the blend of the Te Trois Terroir 2019 so it's predominantly Grenache with some very, the very old Carignan, um, a little bit of, a bit of Sanso, no Syrah in that year. And um, yeah, and that, and that was it. So we, we put in 15% whole bunch, the rest was crushed and distemmed. And then uh, it was, it was aged in large 600 litre um, oak barrels. I do love the evolution on this. I do love when you get that slightly raisined kind of edge from a warmer vintage when mm. it's had a little bit of time in bottle. Uh, but it's got a lovely fragrance in there that's lifted. The syrup is really coming out on that, isn't it? A sort of slightly violet tinged kind of. Yeah, I mean, we. I was actually. I was actually tasting this actually this afternoon. Beautifully, yeah. Yeah, we we were, I tasted this this afternoon um, uh, with some customers, and um, it, from a bottle that had been coravaned. Uh, it had been open for for about a week mm. and it was really amazing actually once once with a bit of de either decanting or or um, open for a while it starts to lose its its sort of tannic streak and it becomes well exactly what we were looking for which is this perfumed more delicate uh, delicate style of, of, of expression of grenache yeah it's delicious it's absolutely delicious i should have I should have uh, tasted this when I got my winner in the gold in the, not the gold cup in Cheltenham earlier. I did well today, Simon. I had shh, don't tell the boss who's listening, but I had one screen up here with Cheltenham on it, and the other screen I was trying really hard to get some work done. <laughs> uh, I won some money anyway, so that's the main thing. Um, I hope you all did if you were interested in it. Uh, um, so let's let's move on to um, we sh we should offer a prize for anyone who wants to guess whose bald head that is. Um, yes. It's not a French one. Yeah. No. Uh, that's your partner in crime, Jared, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's so. There's three of us involved in Les Deux Cols. There's uh, me and Charles Durand, um, who was well known for many years as the sommelier in. Uh, restaurant Patrick Gibo, and that is uh, Jared, Jared, Jared McGuire um, uh, from 64 Wine in Glass Tool, who is our other other partner. And there we're in the process of what's doing a called a décuvage. So we've the, the fermentation is finished, um, and the wine part of the tank has been taken out, moved into another tank, and there we are taking out the grapes, the skins that remain. And they get pumped away using a big screw pump that, that, that's where that guy's standing in the wellies. And that goes away to be pressed uh, in, our, in our press. And then we either reassemble the press wine with the other wine or we, we keep them separate. That's really down to, to tasting. And this is, this is very hard work. You've, that's, a, that's only a 20 hectolitre tank. So that's taken two tonnes of grapes Mm -hmm. um but there's still probably at the end of that about 300 kilos of skins 
that have to be shifted out. And the, the thing that makes it particularly difficult, not so much in that tank, but in some of the larger tanks is there's a lot of residual carbon dioxide from the fermentation. Uh, a, it's dangerous and, and B, it, it makes breathing, you know, you, you can't catch your really breath because because you're uh, you're 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 in, a, in an oxygen poor environment. I like the way you put this slide in here, Simon. So you could show us all. It's not all glamour when you're off for three months in the south of France doing your winemaking. You know, so uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, and the, the 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 next slide is um, I love the next slide uh, because you know if you're in Rioja or if you're in Bordeaux, you have this very smart polished barrel room with lots of new barrels um and a sort of glass thing and it's a but this is just like the back of someone's house there's a shed yeah. tin roof or no actually it's proper roof uh yeah. and and you've got these lovely old big barrels that are housing your wine and that's yeah. what you're all about really isn't it it's clean though that's the main thing as well the importance is clean and yeah yeah so we, we took over this winery as i said from a guy uh, an organic grower um and uh, it was great because we didn't have a barrel space before. So our barrels in our previous winery, so our barrels were just sitting between tanks and things like that. And now we have a dedicated, you, you, you don't get great perspective in that photograph because actually the room is much longer and there are quite a few more barrels in there. Um, but it's great to have a space which is just dedicated to, to barrel aging. Um, and those bigger barrels, those are the 600 litre barrels I was talking about and the ones next to them on the on the metal racks those are 228 litre uh, burgundy barrels mm -hmm. um, and the 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 reason we like the different sizes is because the larger barrels um the larger barrels you get a, a, a greater proportion of wine to wood than you do in the smaller barrels so the oak impact tends to be um more subtle um, the only thing is, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, they're, they're 1800 euros a pot new. So, um, you know, it's quite an investment. So, and I think if I if just for two minutes, just talk about something, because I think it's important is that um, I think one area that we are going to settle on is really our, our wood policy, because you go through uh, as sort of new winemakers taking over new vineyards, you, you know, you're experiencing what the, what the vineyards give for the first time. It's difficult to know straight out, off what the kind of barrels you should be using. Um, and it's only after a few years that once you can assess the quality of the juice that you then say, okay, this is the kind of barrel I want, this is the kind of toast I want, and this is the kind of source of the wood I want. And I've experimented with different cooperages. Those, the, that, uh, the first large barrel you see there is from a, a company called Taranso, but I also have ones from Francois Frere. And in, in, in amongst the barrels, I have barrels from uh, Raymond, Redou, uh, Dami, um, Tonnerie de Mercure, different people that I've, I've, I've trialed. And now I know which ones best suit our kind of winemaking. And so I'm gonna focus in particularly on Taranso barrels. Um, because what I like about them is that they, apart, apart from the, the barrels for the white, for our reds, these have the same idea. They bring more of a support structure to the wine rather than a kind of impactful oak, oaky flavor. Um, so we will gradually start to populate the cellar with more and more Taranso barrels and, and start, to, start to move out some of the other ones. Well... I think uh, I think just the whole activity you're living you are living the dream, Simon. Um, <laughs> just a bit late, Harriet. That's all. Just a bit late. Yeah, no, it's not. You're only a third of the way through your life, Simon. I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, um, so it, before I finish uh, and thank Simon and sort of do a little conclusion, does anyone have any questions or anything they'd like to say about the wine? I love the love from Simon to Simon. Simon's like, oh, I just love your wines. <laughs> it's not actually Simon on another on another. There is another Simon on the call. But but does anyone have any questions or, uh, you know, we're all sort of here. Um, the thing is that the, the main thing, ah, look, the chat's flashing. Here we are. Um, ah, yeah, Louise lives in Wicklow as well, Simon. 
Um, as you live in Wicklow, we can grow grapes for wine in Ireland. Wicklow, like they're doing fairly well in the UK with white wine. We're just not quite there, are we, Simon? No, um, I think um, in terms of wine merchants, we did an interesting exercise uh, just when lock the first lockdown happened to study the read some of the the, the climate data to see if we could successfully if it was possible as a theoretical exercise to find a spot where there'd be enough um the right conditions to be able to produce a commercial vineyard and the conclusion came that we're probably not quite there yet unless there's a very sheltered um south facing spot somewhere that we you know that we haven't seen but it's it's difficult the uk that southeast corner of the uk where they're really the, the bulk of the UK vineyards are, vineyards are is much hotter than um, than here, and much less rain as well. And, I think, and much less rain as well. That's much the main pressure. thing. Yeah, I think Wexford won anyway, Louise. Sadly, we had we Wexford looked like the best place. I was just gutted with my Wicklow hat on, <laughs> um, but uh, Wexford won. Well, um, Simon, uh, I love it. I, this is. I mean, another of our arty, do you like our arty photographs that we took yeah, I love um, them. in the shop? I, I'll send you all of them. They're Please. really, um, they're, they're great. And you know what, uh, JJ, I'm really bad on the pricing. I uh, normally, there could be Jerome or Paul might be here and they might be able to shed light on the pricing. But uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna email you all tomorrow um, uh, from this uh, with a re the recording because some people have missed it and or they're a bit late uh, and also um, we're all going to get 15% off all of Simon's wines don't tell Jeff uh, um, for the next week so do take advantage of that because they are great value and I think well I definitely want more and all my bottles that I got are dummy bottles because they've been caravaned so um, I'm like I'm left wanting anyway so I'll take advantage of the discount um, <laughs> even if you if you all don't but I will be sending an email with that um, or you can just walk into the shop and say say that to the guys um, but I'd love to um, just do a little conclusion because Simon's been great he has had a really busy week let me stop screen sharing now um, he has had a really busy week. He has, uh, he's done Eli on Tuesday. And again, I think they have that on their Instagram live. And he spoke about his whole um, sort of time in wine and it was a lot more in depth. So if you're interested in hearing the backstory, you can watch that again. Um, and last night he was talking to America uh, till midnight. So, uh, so I do, um, I do think I'm just going to, okay, Connor's asking about alcohol uh, and um, integration with alcohol, and I'll just go and touch on that. One parting thought on alcohol is that alcohol is also an expression of sight. You can manage it, but if you're getting a wine that's 11% from the Southern Rhone, there's something wrong. They've removed the alcohol, they've added water. Um, so never judge a bottle by its alcohol. As Connor was saying, his wife loved the reds and didn't comment on the alcohol. And if it's well integrated, then it's giving an expression of where it's come. And the Southern Rhone is a hot place. So you're not gonna get 12 and a half percent alcohol there. I was, I had a request the other day for some Italian wines at tw under 12 and a half. And I found it very hard to find anything that was good under 12 and a half. So I had to discount the good wines to find them a wine that suited the alcohol. So it's like not judging a book by its cover. Don't judge it by the alcohol. Um, okay, I'll continue with my conclusion. There we go. Any other questions? Uh, Simon's obviously living the dream. We're all jealous. Um, Louise and I will set up a vineyard in uh, in Wicklow and Simon can come and make the wine. That's no problem. I have a south facing slope here, 90 meters above sea level. I've just spread lime on it. It's a bit acidic. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, uh, I just can't right. imagine how you can come back and like go to Dublin and have to sell wine when you could be sitting in that amazing vineyard with the birds singing and just dreaming of your wines you're going to make. I just, I just find it amazing. And do you know my biggest worry, Simon, in 10 years time, because your wines have been getting a lot of press quite rightly, because we've all tasted them tonight and they are delicious. My biggest worry is how are you going to make enough wine to, to, to allow the, all of the Irish public to drink it? <laughs> That 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 is the that is the problem we're facing here, you know. Well, thank you, but you know, I think the thing is that the uh, I'm going to follow the Burgundy Burgundy model and just uh, just not get any bigger, but just whack the prices higher and higher. Yeah, yeah, you're bollocks. <laughs> no, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, thank you very much. And, and thank you all for listening. And um, I will send you an email with the recording and obviously, yeah, 15% discount. Um, I'll have that set up for you. And please do tune in for more. If you don't get our newsletter, do sign up for it. And um, again, we, uh, you're great customers and you're all great people and great wine drinkers. And I love having enthusiastic um, people on a wine chat. So uh, thank you all. And Simon, massive thanks. You can now go and relax. <laughs> thanks, Harriet. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks everyone. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.